University. So I want to say this at the very beginning because I've learned in the last few years that um, when I start talking about what I'm going to share with you, uh, some of you right away will say, yeah, but, you know the yeah, buts? Yeah, but that could never work where I live. Yeah, but that's only for urban centers. Yeah, but you have to have seminary students to do that. Yeah, but. So what I want to say to you at the very beginning, uh, before I go any further, is that uh, the principles behind what we're doing with uh, the, the micro communities, those are ancient principles that have always guided God's people when God's people have been healthy. It's about being a holy people. And the last time I checked, you don't have to live in a city to be a holy person. (laughs) In fact, (laughs) there are some things about being in a rural environment that cultivate an atmosphere where it might be a little easier to to step outdoors and pray, if you know what I'm saying. So uh, what I'm talking about can work in any social context. We've test-driven it in any social, various social contexts. It's not just limited to urban environments. It's not just limited to places that have access to seminary students. So far, so good? All right. Um, Let me begin here. A word to my fellow denominational leaders. This This is my mother. I thought I'd show you her picture after I told you about her yesterday. My mother, who's almost 92, and um, she lived with us for the last seven years in our home and was with us sort of nearby for two years before that. And uh, she just moved to Alaska. And my sisters live in Alaska. I used to live in Alaska a long time ago. So my mother uh, moved to Alaska to be close to my sisters because I'm traveling a lot and I'm not available every day to visit with her and you know look after her. So here she is on the plane. I took her picture. And I wanted you to see her because of her, her great spirit of adventure. Uh, living a holy life and following the Holy Spirit is not bound to just young people. It's not bound only to single people. It's not bound only to people that are intellectually gifted. <laughs> Following the Holy Spirit, or as the, as the Celtic people like to say, the wild goose, <laughs> is for everyone. So here she is, and I put her up there. This new movement of the Spirit that God is, under, uh, is, that is underway, that God has breathed, requires elbow room in our institution. Let me just start with this. It requires room for experimentation, evaluation, and adaptation. So please be a help and not a hindrance in the process of what God is doing. We put up so many roadblocks to people who have a creative idea for a form of ministry that they haven't seen before or for a new configuration that could work better in our context. And so I'm asking you to use your power, whatever your power is, as pastor, as DS, as a lay leader, whatever your power is, to open doors instead of closing them, to removing obstacles instead of throwing them down in front of people who are running the good race. We need to have open windows so the Holy Spirit can breathe in and open minds. We need to encourage the equipping and deploying of ordinary lay Christians. This is where we have to go if we're going to follow what the Spirit is doing. We have to make it easier and not harder for people in the ordination track to move into non-traditional ministries. This is where we must go institutionally. So, let's be like the wise woman of Proverbs 31, all of us, and let's laugh at fear. <laughs> Can you do that? I think, I think folks in North Carolina should be good at that. I mean, a lot of you like to kayak, and I know the last time I got on whitewater, uh, it was scary. <laughs> But the best thing is to go on this adventure and when you, when you come up against this new thing and it's a little scary, let's laugh about that. Let's give ourselves permission to fail. Let's try something new and different and learn from our mistakes. Let's chill out about it. Let's go. All right. Adaptive challenge. The solutions to our current problems cannot be found from the level of consciousness that created them. This is Uncle Albert Einstein saying this. 
In other words, the problems that we face in any institution, in any situation, the problems that we face when we have a systemic problem cannot be solved by the exact same thinking that led to the problem forming. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to have a new kind of thinking. And so in leadership circles today, they're talking about adaptive challenge and adaptive leadership. This kind of uh, challenge, when the old way of thinking is not working anymore, it requires people to change their ways rather than the experts to fix the problem. So ordinary people are the ones that are going to start surfacing the solutions. And at this time in our uh, history as Christians, as United Methodists, ordinary people are beginning to say things to us that will help us fix what's broken. (laughs) Yesterday I mentioned the uh, person at the check-in desk who was the voice of the Holy Spirit. You can't beat people to make them go to church. (laughs) That old way of coercion doesn't work anymore. and We've got to give it up. So the example that Ron Heifetz gives, Ron Heifetz is a leadership expert who has coined this adaptive leadership, adaptive uh, change language. He gives the example of somebody who has to have uh, bypass surgery. So they go to the heart surgeon, they have the bypass surgery, and uh, the surgeon does everything well, the hospital does everything right, the patient comes out, but if the patient is going to live for a while, he or she has to change their lifestyle. It's up to the patient to make the real changes, right? The surgeon cannot make you stop eating potato chips. <laughs> and this is the hard part. Uh, Hefet says that 80% of people who have that bypass surgery go back and keep doing the same things that led to the clogged arteries. They don't make the necessary changes. So it's up to the people to make these necessary changes. Adaptive change requires experimentation on a grassroots level. This is a fact. What this means for us in our denomination is that we have to be watching for, we, remember yesterday I talked about being contemplative, showing up and paying attention, cooperating with God? We have to watch for people and ideas and situations that appear to be an experiment trying to form. <laughs> sort of like artesian springs bubbling up and it's happening all around. People are having some ideas of things that they would like to try or something that might work. I've heard of a lot of uh, interesting experiments that are popping up in western North Carolina because I've been in conversation for a year now with the folks from western North Carolina. But it's out of this experimentation, and you know you have to be okay with failure if you're going to be an experimenter. (laughs) We have to think differently about failure. So long in our church, you know, if somebody tried something new and it failed, then everybody heaped shame and blame and scorn and... And, and, you know, sort of drove them into the ground for even trying something, and we'll never try that again. We've got to change our way of thinking about failure and say uh, our best wisdom comes from failure. Failure is one of our closest friends. (laughs) So that's how we're going to be able to do these uh, changes that we need to make. So we're in this time of massive adaptive challenge where what was working before isn't working anymore, Massive cultural changes. You can read Phyllis Tickle, uh, The Great Emergence. I highly recommend it if you have not read it. She talks about how every 500 years there are massive cultural changes that affect everything. And we're in one of those shifts. So how can the church thrive in its missional vocation? I believe that the church has a missional vocation. That word mission, missio, means sent out. Yesterday I talked about us as a sent-out people who belong to a a God who sends God's self out all the time. Good Trinitarian theology. So how do we thrive in this situation where what we used to do is in a decline? What kind of leadership is needed? Well, this is where um, the work that I'm involved with comes in. We started New Day, we started the Epworth Project, the Academy for Missional Wisdom, I'm going to talk about those today. Um, We started a foundation, the Missional Wisdom Foundation, to be the umbrella organization for experimentation, for figuring out 
new ways to do this. These are some of our responses to our adaptive challenge. Now this picture on the screen is from Lindisfarne, Holy Island. It's a place where I take students when we go on our Celtic monastic missional pilgrimage, which I just came back from one of those. It was very wonderful. And uh, we trace the steps of these early saints who evangelized the Celts. So we go to Lindisfarne, which is in northern England, and then we go to Iona, and we spend days there learning from the Iona community. And one of the things that, uh, that really strikes the imagination of students, and it has captured my, my heart, is looking at all of these buildings. This used to be a cathedral, these ruins. This is a cathedral, and those flat stones on the bottom are um, graves, you know, with this, the saints who've died and they've buried them there and they put the stone with their name on them in the floor of the cathedral. Of course, the floor is now grass. There are lots of sheep that graze. <laughs> and then right here in the front, this little rectangle, is an advertisement for a cell phone company. This place that was once a cathedral, a place of learning, of worship, of formation, a place of monastic life, has become a tourist spot. As you travel through Glasgow and Edinburgh and, and any major city in Europe, all these cathedrals, these churches that are no longer used for worship, or only one little corner is used for worship and 15 people show up on Sunday morning in the little corner for worship, the rest of it has become a museum or a pub. I ate lunch in a former church. It was filled with people having a good time. And so what, what, why I want my students to see this uh, European the, what, post-Christendom church, I want them to think about how they are investing their lives. We are used to investing our lives in building a church that requires cathedral buildings, massive, expensive pieces of property that cost a lot of money to maintain, we're used to thinking about church as a church that's in league with the state in one way or another, even here in the U.S. We're used to thinking about the church working with secular power in order to do what the church wants to do. We're used to thinking about the church as an empire. But we're in a different day now. And what has happened in Europe, what's happened in the U.K., where we go and we have this pilgrimage, is speaking prophetically to us in the U.S. If you go up to the Northeast in the U.S., uh, it's, it's a lot like Europe. Now, does this mean people are no longer spiritual and they no, no longer want to worship God and they're not interested in, in faith communities or something that will nourish their souls? Absolutely not. People are as spiritual as ever. <laughs> but the kind of faith community people hunger for it is not a big mega anything. <laughs> and so uh, as we go on this pilgrimage and I take these students, what they learn is how the, the Celts were evangelized by anonymous Christians a long, long time ago. We don't even know who the first Christians were who evangelized the Celts. They were just regular people who've become nameless. I like that. <laughs> Ordinary people. So we go and we learn how they did this. They did it by adapting to the culture, getting to know the language, getting to know the songs and the, the rhythms of people's lives, and forming small faith communities, and working with the people in these small faith communities, and being disciplined about their spiritual lives. So, so this is, um, we take students here in order to uh, open their hearts and minds to this different paradigm. In the Book of Discipline, oddly enough, we're going to look at that for a moment. <laughs> book of Discipline, can you see this well enough to read it in unison with me? Let's read this aloud. This is paragraph 161. I just love it. The community provides the potential for nurturing human beings into the fullness of their humanity. We believe we have a responsibility to innovate, sponsor, and evaluate new forms of community that will encourage development of the fullest potential in individuals. It's in our book of discipline. At this time of adaptive challenge, we have a responsibility 
to experiment, innovate, evaluate, learn from our mistakes, and keep, keep doing this so that we can keep in step with the Spirit and what the Spirit is doing and what the Spirit is saying to the church. So we formed the Mission of Wisdom Foundation. We being one of my doctoral students and myself. He was my master's student when I first met him. He, he was a, a, a businessman before he came to seminary. He was a very successful businessman. I didn't know this when I first met him. It was one, on one of these pilgrimages to Iona where I met him. He'd come, he was a student in my class. And I met him, and we began talking about our, our mutual interest in creating new forms of faith communities where young adults would feel they could connect in spiritual practice and in missional outreach. And while we were on Iona, before, still before I knew his business background, God called him to work with me. I, I don't have a business background. I'm a theologian and a pastor and somebody that talks at people. You know, so. so he came alongside, and, and together we formed this Missional Wisdom Foundation. I had already started two kinds of new monastic communities in Dallas. I'd started a house where some students lived together in intentional community. I had started a microchurch that was uh, learning how to, the leadership team, I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. So I had already started some of these experiments, but I knew God had a whole lot more in mind. So Larry came alongside, his name is Larry Duggins, and you'll see him in one of these videos we're going to watch. And uh, we formed the Missional Wisdom Foundation to be the umbrella for the Epworth Project, this, what is now a whole network of new monastic communities, and for the uh, Academy for Missional Wisdom, which we have now that's been going for a year to train people to do these kinds of things. And so we formed this foundation, and, it, and our goal and our purpose as a foundation is to um, help people create experimental communities of various kinds, to help churches learn how to be, move from being an attractional a church that's all about itself into becoming a missional church that's all about sending people into all kinds of contexts to be the church there. So that's what the Missional Wisdom Foundation is about. It's a, a freestanding 501c3. It's not um, part of the general board of anything. <laughs> and uh, But we work closely with many United Methodist churches, conferences, um, uh, and other organizations, and we're reaching out beyond the United Methodist Church now to other denominations as well. So uh, our structure is, looks like that. Uh, we are now an approved extension ministry within Central Texas Conference. Our mission is to build a generation of leaders who practice missional Christianity by living it in community. Living it in community. We're going to look at that in detail. There are three methods that we use, uh, that we're experimenting with. First is through living in community. New monasticism, where people live together in the same house or the same apartment complex or in some duplexes. They live close by each other in different configurations. I'm talking about people of all ages, uh, various races, different economic strata, um, every kind of diversity you can think is involved in this, in our experiments, uh, different ages. And so they live together and they follow a common rule of life and they engage in missional outreach in the neighborhoods where they live. So that's, so New Day, uh, I'm sorry, the Epworth Project is our experiment of this network of communities where people live together, okay? Whoops, I'm sorry. Then um, we have another experiment of worshiping in community, and these are called New Day communities. These are micro churches, little congregations of 15 to 30 people who gather for worship, who gather for fellowship around the table, and who are embedded in local neighborhoods where they can make a difference with people living in poverty with people facing struggle in life, with people in life transitions. And these little New Day communities, at this time of development, which these keep evolving out, at this time all of our New Day communities are anchored in an anchor church, an established congregation. So you know about satellite campuses. Uh, some of the large churches have satellites, 
And, and the larger churches that do satellites typically have, um, in the satellite congregation, they have the pastor from back at the big church piped in with a sermon. You know what I'm saying? We don't do that. We, we follow a, a different pattern because we believe you have to know people well to be able to do the sermon together with them because every community is different. So I'll go into detail about that in a moment. But these are, these are little micro churches. They're churches. They're not small groups. They're not Emmaus reunion groups. They're not Bible studies. They're not recovery groups. Although there are elements of all those things that feel familiar when you're in a New Day community. These are micro churches that are intentionally small and nimble. And the people don't live in the same house in the New Day. Okay? All right. And then the third one is learning and community. We've developed an academy for missional wisdom that enables people who live in various places to go through a two-year program and learn the theory and the practice to gain practical skills and have coaching to start and lead all sorts of different configurations of missional, new monastic micro-communities. So far, so good? All righty. So we're going to look now at the Epworth Project in detail. This is the one where people live together. And in this one, we have a network. We have six of these now in the Metroplex um, in different social uh, locations. And um, the people who live here, you'll see some of them in the video. They'll tell you what they're doing. And these keep emerging and evolving. We're getting ready to start two in Latino neighborhoods. Um, and we're starting one of those this month, and another one will be starting in about three months in Fort Worth. Pretty excited about it. And what we do is, do, is focus on um, inviting emerging le young leaders into it. By young, I don't necessarily mean chronologically young. I mean they're young in terms of new in ministry, feeling called to something different, something non-traditional, something with a rigorous spiritual practice and a prophetic and missional engagement in the neighborhood. And so we, we really want to make this available for them. And so people will come in and live in an Epworth house for a, one to three years, and they'll live there while they're doing whatever they're doing. Some of them are students. Some of them work in nonprofits. We've had some uh, Wesley Foundation campus ministers living in our houses. We also have some refugees living in our houses. It's a, it's a motley crew. <laughs> And there they learn how to live this different lifestyle. They learn skills in community building, community organizing. They learn to live a simpler lifestyle with a healthier relationship with material wealth. One that is consciously resistant of this uh, unchecked consumption that is the culture in which we live. And so that's what they do, and they follow a, a practice, a spiritual practice. They follow um, rhythms of prayer, morning and evening prayer, and uh, hospitality in the neighborhood. They have to have a community meal or something like that at least once a week for the neighbors. And, uh, they, and the students and whoever lives in these houses is required to serve at least four hours a week in the neighborhood in missional service. We've located our houses strategically so we can plug right into some kind of community development organization that's already doing a good job. So we can plug those students in. So for example, um, we've got one house, the Bonhoeffer House, that works primarily with homeless people. So we plugged them right in with an organization that already knows how to work with homeless people in a healthy way so that we're not reinventing the wheel on things. We're all about networking. So let's watch this short video about the Epworth Project. My name is Larry Duggins. I'm the director of the Missional Wisdom Foundation and uh, a pastor at White's Chapel United Methodist in Southlake. 
Um, uh, Elaine Heath and I um, worked together to form the Missional Wisdom Foundation because we thought it was incredibly important to provide a platform where um, people could practice Christianity by living it. Um, we really believed that um, if we helped communities form around a rule of life um, and made that rule of life um, extremely practical and related to um, the theology that we uh, were, were so familiar with as United Methodists that we um, would end up with a generation of leaders who were much more about living Christianity than uh, talking about it. And so um, we began with a single community of, of, of three women living together and have now grown to multiple communities, both men and women, and we're at the kind of the phase where we're seeing people graduate from the communities and go out into the world and uh, almost without exception uh, they are finding ways to be able to um, live Christianity in a means of service uh, in, in ministry or uh, uh, most importantly in lay ministry. The, the Epworth Project houses got started by trying to like I said integrate faith into all aspects of students lives it's a scholarship program where people live in a house in different parts of the DFW area. Each house has its own spe uh, speciality. This one works with the homeless in East Dallas. And when we first moved in, we actually thought that we were going to be reaching out to the African refugees because next door was the, the immigration for, for East Dallas. And so with the Dallas Refugee Services, we thought that we would be look working with them. But as soon as we moved in, they moved out. And so we had to learn what the neighborhood was like, and we found out that there's a large population of homeless. We have daily prayer, and we move that daily prayer outside twice a week. And by moving that daily prayer outside, and there were a lot of homeless that would be walking by, and we would invite them to, to join us in prayer. And they started to learn a little bit about what we were doing at the house. And then through that, more people started to come by the house. And now we can't go um, a single weekend without having someone come by and knock on our door um, to, to just sit down, to relax, to share what's going on in their lives, and to sometimes get a meal. I heard through Brandon actually in one of my classes that this kind of opportunity existed to where people are uh, living in an intentional community, um, really surrounding themselves around, around a monastic lifestyle that is not just something you leave when you go home from church or from school. People are very thirsty of uh, like in churches. When they know that this is time for church, you see everyone really you know, that's that hunger and hand you see, they want to go to church. You know. And um, they spend a lot of time in church, not not uh, comparing to America that I hear what I have already discovered is that I think one hour in America it's like enough for them to go to church. Um, but uh, in Africa they have time to worship the Lord in singing. And uh, if it is time like for intercession or prayers in church, even the real people are very committed to that. My name is Amy Spohr. I'm the house pastor here at the Oscar Romero House, which is one of the houses of the Epworth Project, uh, where we've come together to live an intentional Christian community together and to be uh, incarnational in our ministry with our brothers and sisters in our neighborhood. Um, in the Oscar Romero House right now, um, in this house there are five girls and also associated with the Oscar Romero House is an apartment. It's just down the street, um, and a couple um, live there named William and Mirabel. And um, they come, they pray with us daily, they share meals with us. Um, they're completely part of our community, but because they're married, um, they need a little bit of extra space um, to call their own. Um, so they live in an in a apartment complex just down the road. Uh, we, we have a common rule of life that's shared among the, uh, uh, among the houses and among the New Day communities. Um, that can be adjusted by the individual houses, um, but uh, as a rule, uh, they tend to um, uh, stay with the, the concept. It is based on the United Methodist Baptismal Covenant, so it has to do with prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Um, so again, tying into that West and tradition that we have. When we're accepted to the house, we um, agree to live by this rule of life that includes um, 
being intentional about prayers, hospitality, um, a witness, a presence in the community, um, those sorts of things. So each morning we um, pray together. The main part of kind of being here is just kind of a learning um, move, just kind of getting to know this rule of life and really adapting it to your life. It's not just, oh, I'm living here, living this life because I'm in this house. It's a lifestyle change of a daily habit that I want to keep with me forever. Just really like living the life of like, okay, like I'm going to commit a time to be, you know, in prayer with the people that I'm living with. And I'm going to commit to knowing my neighbors, getting to know my community, you know, given and taken where I can in the community. So I think it's really just adapting it as a lifestyle. So it's not like what I'm going to take when I leave. It's just what I'm going to keep doing when I leave. Um, we've been uh, very intentional in choosing names for our community and uh, one of the, the central names is the project name itself, the Ep Epworth Project. Uh, Epworth was the, um, the, 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 the little town in which uh, John Wesley grew up and in which John Wesley's father uh, was the parish priest and so um, it had to do with home. Uh, Epworth has to do with um, a, a footing in the church, but it also has to do with being a launching place, a place from which John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, uh, launched his career as uh, a maverick, as a revolutionary, and as a, uh, a person who passionately believed in uh, the importance of the church in every person's life. So that's the Epworth Project, where people live together. We, uh, we don't have a permanent community there, you know, in the Benedictine tradition, you take a vow of stability when you're going to live in community, and you, you, you vow, I'm going to stay with this group of people until I get old and die. That's not what the Epworth Project is for. It's a place for experimentation, for people can come and live for a little while, learn how to do this, and then go on. So it's a fluid community. But it's having quite an impact now. We're at the stage of our development where a number of people who've lived in our Epworth Project homes and, and ministry centers have gone on to form communities somewhere else. They've moved somewhere else, they've graduated from school or they've, they've moved away uh, to, to, one of them was in Mongolia. <laughs> uh, so they're taking that DNA elsewhere and that's what we hoped for. Okay, the next one we'll look at is New Day and these are the micro communities in and near the, the Dallas-Fort Worth me metroplex. These are the micro churches. And these are led by teams of people we have a decidedly democratic leadership preference. Why? Well, I could give good reasons from the Bible. <laughs> One, you know, we're the body of Christ and we all have these gifts that work together. I could give some good, and there's no, you know, in Christ there's no Jew nor Greek, etc. But also, this is the way the world is going. You may have noticed the Arab Spring. <laughs> People are saying we are not going to have dictatorships anymore whether they are political dictatorships or ecclesiastical dictatorships. People are saying we're, we're finished with that. And the move, and it has to do with the information revolution. Everybody who has access to the internet has access to power because we have access to knowledge. And so um, for many reasons that we don't have time to go into, uh, being, being in a post-colonial and post-modern society, people are wanting to be in organizations where there's shared power. So our New Day communities are led by teams of five to seven people who share the leadership in a rotating way. And those leaders follow a Wesleyan rule of life together. It's kind of like an old-fashioned class or band meeting, a hybrid of that. And those of us who are leaders in New Day meet twice a month for covenant accountability. We'll get into some more of those details in a little bit. But the, so the leadership is not by professional clergy, although we have some clergy that are involved. This is a model that empowers lay people particularly to form and to lead micro communities in all sorts of places. It's very exciting. There's nothing like doing something like this to cultivate a real disciple. You can't cultivate a disciple on Sunday morning with 500 people facing forward. 
You know that, right? It doesn't work. New Day is a faith-based community that is grounded in worship and friendship and Bible study. We come together, we eat together, we worship together. Um, it's a place where anyone can be exactly who they are and feel accepted. Uh, we actually bring together a lot of differences, different people, um, different cultures, um, different incomes. Um, you could be of a different religion and still find a place of home here. Um, it's a table where all have a voice. Uh, we take turns sharing in food, to bringing food, to leading the worship. Um, it lessens the power distance. It's a place for all. We come together uh, Sunday nights or Saturday nights for Nueva Dia. And we worship, we gather, have a meal together, a simple meal. We talk, we catch up, we just you know, chit chat for an hour. And then we start with, with the call to worship and prayer. But then we get to, we read scripture in different languages and then we have a discussion instead of a sermon. Discussion in worship is something that has been invaluable to my growth as a person of faith. My personal life change. It's not like a to be in a building. It's outside the building. Like a, when Wesley say, my word is the parish, it's very similar. It's not like a, you need to be in the church to worship God, to be to serve God. When I am in Nuevo Dia, I feel like a, I am in a house, in a God house too, but it's another environment. It's more flexible. It's more that you can be you. Mm -hmm. um, well, I grew up interested in missions. Um, I always thought I would go and do those missions. Um, I really have a heart for Africa and while I think that will always continue, um, just recently I realized the importance of, of welcoming people to, to my country as well. Um, and so I think this is a great way of doing that. Um, I think um, we're pretty intentional about going to the communities where there is a lot of diversity, where there are um, immigrants, where there are refugees and just welcoming them and worshiping with them because they have a lot to share with us and just as we have a lot to share with them. The way we do our fellowship actually different and this is what I've learned from New Day because what we normally do back home is like people, I mean from the neighborhood they, they, they just visit one another like let's say today we are meeting as uh, Jacob's place. So all the neighborhood will kind of in the evening gather at Jacob's place and Jacob will have prepared maybe some meal. So we fellowship together, we pray together and we bring our concerns on the table. So we encourage one another in faith. But what we, we were not doing is kind of sharing the scripture as in we all of us get engaged into the scripture. So we had one person sharing the word of which somehow it's not good. But when we get engaged into the scripture, all of us as in, what have you learned from this scripture? You know, it, it will help us to grow in faith. I'm excited uh, more about uh, New Day community at Garan because there is a Hispanic community there. And when we get there, we shall uh, get to know them, interact with them. Then from there, through interaction, we shall be able to, to reach them through sharing the word of God and sharing them more about the love of God. I came here in the U.S. as a refugee. When I reached here, I was received by the New Day. And even this time, I'm still participating in the New Day. From the beginning, things were very tough because of the language. But the New Day was beneficial to me because they taught me more about the language and even the Word of God. I have run a lot from people, especially from Christians, more about love. They love one another and we bless one another. Yeah, my dream is to tell people truth. To tell people God's word. How, how people can know God's word because I know myself, my testimony.
When I was 90 years old, my daughter gave a birthday party for me. It was a, an open house, and as I understand it was somewhere around 79 people came. Most of the New, New Day people came, and it was just wonderful. As the people could come and go as they wanted to, they had lots of things to eat and all kinds of good things. And then uh, uh, many of the New Day people came. And I've even had the guys at the New Day doing the hokey pokey too. And they didn't know exactly what that was, but I told them it was a little kid's game, a little dance step, and it's just really okay to do that. When I was in the hospital, they all came to see me too, and they gathered around the bed and they sang to me in Swahili. And the people, the nurses and the other people were there at the hospital, they stood out in the hall and listened. And they were very impressed that I had all these wonderful men coming in to see me, most of them from the Congo, and all smiling and calling me grandma at my invitation. I think the model does not say that we're necessarily a church. I would prefer the term um, worship community uh, because I think the church comes with a lot of baggage, honestly. I think we think a building, um, I think we think a pulpit and a pastor and um, pews that all face the exact same way and, and that's a church. Kind of as a kid, you hear um, this is the church, this is the steeple, open it up and there's the people, right? So, so we don't fit that model at all. Um, we're actually more than a building and, and pews listening to one voice. We're, we're a community that really wants to learn from each other and we really want to be friends with each other. I don't, I don't go on Saturday nights because I want to be heard as a, a pastor by the conference. Maybe it's my night to lead on the leadership team. That's not why I go because I feel like I have something to teach. I go because I may have not seen my friends for a week and I'm eager for them to teach me as well. And the discussion is so rich, I can't, I can't even wait to hear what's discussed tonight. I'm, it's a part of my daily routine that I look forward to. Okay, so those are the micro churches. And um, what happened was we started having people coming to see us, visiting New Day, visiting the Epworth Project, wanting to see what was going on. More and more people were wanting to come and spend two or three days with us. And we determined through a process of prayer and reflection that it was time to start a regular systematic way of equipping people because it seemed that there's so many people were hungry and interested. So we started the academy last fall. And the Academy for Missional Wisdom is a two-year program. Uh, there's a little video that I think I put the video in here. I hope I did. Um, but it, it, it provides... Um, training in the theoretical foundations and the practical hands-on, here's how to do this for ordinary people. It's geared for lay people. It's very accessible. So it includes four training retreats over a period of two years. There are four training retreats that are typically Thursday evening through Saturday noon. Um, it includes, I think it's three uh, retreat days that are one day long with your spiritual director. We have a spiritual director who accompanies the cohort. The academy is local. We come to you. And um, uh, then it also involves coaching and six online classes. So uh, through the classes, through the retreats, through the spiritual direction, through the coaching, through all of it over a period of two years, we walk with you to help you learn how to do this. And um, what we help you to do is form a contemplative practice because for us, hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church requires that we learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit, uh, not only individually, but in community. And so we focus a lot on spiritual direction, on spiritual practice. And we also teach missional ecclesiology. Each of the six classes that are online classes require the reading of one book, and it's a book that's easily accessible to lay people. Um, we currently have uh, people in ages from age 21 to 62 in our academy, uh, and a very diverse lot in every way you can think of. And um, we're at the stage now, we're one year into it, and we're at the stage now where our, our participants are all forming new communities all across the country. Isn't that exciting? 
Um, one of our um, students in it this year is from Western North Carolina. And she's doing a great job. We're really proud of her. So um, let me see if they put that in here. Yes, so let's watch this short video about the Academy. The Academy for Missional Wisdom is a two-year program that helps people, both laity and clergy, learn how to start and lead missional micro-communities. Two different kinds of communities. Um, communities like New Day, where these are small churches that are anchored in larger churches and they're located in missional contexts. And also um, communities where people live together in the same house or apartment complex and engage in ministry in the neighborhood. Um, the Academy is very reasonably priced and all the people who are teaching in it have experience leading micro communities as well as having graduate degrees in theology and so have, have all the theological background that they need. The Academy of Missional Wisdom is all about sharing educational resources. Dr. Heath has gathered together a group of folks who have put in a significant amount of time studying missional church but um, the group of instructors has also gone beyond simply studying and has engaged in uh, different forms of living out missional church. The idea is to be able to take our life experience, to take our experience with the Epworth Project uh, and the new monastic communities that we have there, and our experience with the New Day worshiping communities, and pull all that together in a way that we can share it broadly with anyone who is interested in starting a similar project. A missional micro-community is something like New Day. It's a community that um, may have 15 to 30 people in it. They meet for worship in a home or an apartment or a community space. And then they're engaged in mission in the neighborhood uh, during the week. Uh, a missional micro-community might do things like assist refugees with uh, resettlement here in the United States. They might help with ESL classes, after school programs, um, assistance for single moms, um, help with homeless people. There are any number of uh, outreach ministries that a missional micro community can be a part of. The Academy for Missional Wisdom is not a substitute for seminary. It's not a comprehensive seminary program in terms of the curriculum. It's really focusing on missional ecclesiology. It's really focusing on how to start and lead these kinds of communities. The, the Academy consists of four weekend retreats that typically start on a Thursday evening and go through uh, Saturday afternoon. And then we have six online classes. Each of them are six weeks long. Uh, we use a, a Moodle, which is a, a simple to use software and uh, you read one book and there are reflection papers. We have a spiritual director for the academy and, and the spiritual direction, the peer spiritual formation groups take place online. And then um, we also have two practicums with coaching. So by the end of the first year, the student has gathered a lead team and is beginning to train the lead team. And at the end of the, uh, the training session, they start their community by the end of the second year, their community has been functioning for several months and we have provided the coaching they need to get it grounded really well. Well, our hope for the Academy is that um, we can provide equipping so that ordinary lay people can be engaged in significant mission. They can help to start and lead missional communities that are anchored in their churches so that Ordinary lay people can be out in our cities and out in our rural areas providing missional leadership and deepening in their own discipleship. It's a combination of both academic work and practical life, a combination of understanding theology and understanding the application of theology that makes the Academy unique. So we are starting the Carolina Academy. Uh, like I said, we go to you, so we come to you for the retreats. And the Carolina Academy is starting in September. Uh, the opening retreat will be at Lake June, Alaska. The second retreat will be in Raleigh, uh, I'm sorry, in um, Durham at uh, the Rootba House with Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. He's part of our network of friends and colleagues. 
Um, and there will be a third retreat likely in Asheville is where it will be held, and then the fourth retreat will be back in uh, Lake June, Alaska. So we'll be coming to uh, Western North Carolina for the Carolina Academy, and if you're interested in that, um, at the close of this session, um, John Boggs, do you want to just let them know where you are? John Boggs is, he'll be over here in the corner. If you're interested in that academy, you can come over and talk to John Boggs. He's a DS there and is going to be very involved in it. So yesterday I talked about Dark Night of the Church and this sense of dryness, of coldness, of dark, of not knowing where we're going. Uh, one of the ways that the great saints have talked about it is winter. It's a time of winter where it looks like everything is dead. And so when, when Scott Kisker and I wrote our book, Longing for Spring, we were thinking about this longing that we have when we're in that dark night of the church, that winter of the church. And so here's how we see signs of spring emerging through what is happening in these communities that we're a part of. And it's not just what we're doing. I, I hear from people all the time all over the place. All sorts of experiments are popping up. Um, some inside the UMC and many outside. So it's coming through missional micro-communities. Our rule of life that we follow is based on our membership vows. Prayers, presence, gift, service, and witness. We meet, uh, the, the lead teams for these communities meet twice a month for a covenant group to check in and be accountable for how we're living. And underneath each of these five areas, we have three bullet points of actual things to do. So like fasting from food at least once a week in some capacity. That's one of our things that we covenant to do and we answer for. Uh, showing hospitality to the neighbors that live right next to me in my neighborhood. I regularly have to tell my lead team what I'm doing to show hospitality to my immediate next door neighbors. You know, if you keep saying, I forgot, or I haven't met them, or I don't know, you start to feel that uncomfortable peer pressure. <laughs> this is how John Wesley formed these class meetings and band meetings, and that was the backbone of Methodism. It was the class meeting that made Methodism the largest Christian movement in North America in the 19th century. It was not preachers. It was lay people meeting in class meetings. And so we're actually retrieving our own heritage but retooling it for our current context. We don't feel slavishly bound to do everything exactly and precisely, legalistically, the way John Wesley. So for example, in our band sort of conversations, we don't focus just on sin, although we do talk about sin too. We do confess together too. So the leaders follow this rule of life that's based upon these membership vows. Our anchor churches do not have to be big. We have an anchor church that's quite small, but they do have to have a missional vision. The anchor church does need to believe that you can have church outside the walls of the church building. And the, it does need to believe that lay people are called to significant ministry, that ministry is not the purview of professionally trained clergy who have master's degrees, but it is the responsibility of every Christian. So our lead team covenant, I told you we meet twice monthly. It's focused on fidelity to rule of life. It's all about encouragement, support, accountability, and it's egalitarian. Now, this is a challenge to those of us who've been trained to keep very strict professional boundaries between ourselves and everybody that we serve, right? I know when I was trained to be a pastor, I went through ordination and I went through school and all that, they said, you cannot befriend your parishioners. It's not allowed. You must keep a strict professional boundary between yourself, the clergy, and those people, the laity. If you cross the boundary, it will get muddy and confused and you'll regret it sorely. This is what I was taught. But then I opened the Bible and I saw what Paul said. <laughs> and Paul said, I was among you as a mother with her little children. And I thought, hmm, professional boundaries, Holy Scripture, so-and-so, the Apostle Paul. <laughs> and then I read those disturbing books, the Gospels. And I saw Jesus living with the people he was training. And it kept being haunted by Jesus living with the people. So they got to see him catch a cold, be tired, get cranky once in a while maybe, I don't know. <laughs> 
And so I decided that I would, I would do this covenant accountability even if the people in the lead team were my students. That's another boundary. You're not supposed to be friends with your students. You must keep strict boundaries. And, and I'm pretty good about boundaries. I had to learn boundaries when I went through all my recovery and healing from abuse. I know all about boundaries. But I've discovered that I cannot teach my students to live with covenant accountability if I don't show them what it looks like. You have to show people things. You can't just give them a book and tell them to read it. So I practice the same accountability that if I've got a lead team and there are two students and there's a refugee and there's an old man with uh, disabilities and then there's me and that's the lead team, I answer the same questions that everybody else answers. It's egalitarian. And it works. Here's what these missional micro-communities facilitate in the church, the church at large, or in a, a local church, an anchor, anchor church. They facilitate leadership development that is spiritual, that is missional, and that is shared by people. They facilitate that organically. They facilitate disciple formation that is contemplative and missional, that bring together the inner life and the outer life. They facilitate a holistic evangelism that rejects coercion, manipulation, and control of other people. Real evangelism, the way the saints and the mystics practiced it. They facilitate economically sustainable mission for which the people take responsibility. All of our New Day communities are self-funding. The anchor church does not pay for them. They're self-funding. You can do that when you have bivocational leadership. Did I mention that? We're all bivocational leaders. The people who lead New Day don't get paid to lead New Day. And since we meet in borrowed or shared space, there's very little cost for this place where we're meeting. And all the money that comes in in our offerings goes right back out into the community and mission, every penny of it. We're missional. It's great. And these facilitate a thoroughly empowered lay ministry. There's no reason why lay people can't do the ministry that God has called them to. We've got to remove the obstacles. So this, this is a way to do that. These are some qualities we look for in lead team members. Maybe you're starting to think of back home, and you're thinking, wow, maybe we could do something like that. Or I wonder if we could send somebody to the academy to get some training to do something like this. Lead team members need to be, first of all, loving people. If they don't like people, this is not the right thing for them to do. <laughs> They need to be hospitable. Even if they're a little rough around the edges, that's okay. As long as they're loving, if they generally have a loving orientation. Uh, they need to be open and welcoming of people who are different from themselves. So if they're bigots, if they hate gay people, if they can't stand somebody with an accent, not good candidates for this kind of ministry. <laughs> because what we've found when we started these communities is all sorts of people show up. I remember the night that um, I wasn't at this particular gathering because I was out of town, but everybody phoned me and emailed me immediately. I got like this flood of emails right after the e meeting ended. Uh, it was at New Day in one of the refugee neighborhoods, and they said, Elaine, Elaine, some Mormons stumbled into our gathering tonight. And they said, and, and they wanted to witness to us, but we told them, why don't you just eat with us? And we invited them, and they didn't want to stay, but we talked them into staying and eating with us. And, and then while they were there, the Muslims came. <laughs> And it was like everybody showed up and there was this crazy mix of people and they said, and we had the best time. We all ate together, we told our stories, we tried to get the Mormons to stay and worship with us but they had to go somewhere else. But we told them, please come back, you can worship with us in the future, we'd love to see you again. And, and they, said, they said what had happened. And it was this, I mean, where is that going to happen in a local church where you sit in the pews and face forward? Honestly. See, some, some things can only be done around the kitchen table, in the living room, sitting on the front porch, with the neighbors. So this facilitates that kind of environment. So you need people who are open to people who are different. You need people who are non-judgmental, uh, folks who are humble, ready to learn. They're not know-it-alls. A know-it-all will kill it immediately. <laughs> Right? Um, you need somebody who's reliable. They're going to be there when they said they would. 
uh, somebody for whom this will be their primary ministry. Somebody can't be on a lead team of a New Day community and also sing in the choir and teach Sunday school and be the chair of the board of something. People have to be freed up from all that other stuff so that this can be what they do. This is church that they do, right? Uh, somebody who's spiritually alive, or at least a seeker, <laughs> a seeker, uh, somebody who's as healthy as possible emotionally, because when you start doing community together, all your buttons get pushed. And if you're just a big mess, New Day's a great place to heal, but you probably shouldn't be a leader for a little while until you begin to heal from some of that big mess stuff. But New Day is a great place for people who are a big mess to come and be part of the community. It's a great place for that. It's very healing. Okay, how do these communities actually connect to the anchor church? Um, at least one of the pastors at the anchor church needs to be in the lead team, not to lead it, but to participate and be accountable for his or her life. So that they're following the same rule of life, and they get to hear the stories, and they get to participate in the discernment that goes on when the, when the micro-community has to make decisions about how it's going to reach out. Um, so they meet in the covenant group. The New Day can regularly include people from the Anchor Church when they do missional outreach. Our communities regularly, like once a month, we have a big party or potluck or shindig or whatever outside, and we invite everybody. The weather accommodates that in Texas. Um, there are other things you can do. We, we have classes. We have language classes. We have coaching classes because some of the people we serve need to figure out how to use things like the grocery store, public transportation, where, where is a doctor for a low-income family. So we have an equipping classes for things like that. Um, and then we also can involve people from the anchor church. They come when we have this barbecue or whatever, and they bring food and they take part, so they start to make friends with people. Um, people from the anchor church can be on the lead team. There are varying levels of commitment that people from the anchor church can do. So right now, Larry and I are writing a book. We have a contract for it, and it should be finished by next September, uh, called Missional Monastic Mainline. And it is our, um, it is our um, handbook for how to start and lead these communities and stories from around uh, different places. And that book will be not only for Methodists, but also for um, other people in mainline traditions. <laughs>